Hello, I'm Yari, or Yari, your average writer on the internet. In this video, I'd like to give you 8 reasons why Euro 5 is a disaster for motorcycling. I'll attempt to argue that shiny and new motorcycle features in tech are not always great for motorcycling, especially if they relate to Euro 5 emission standards. I will enumerate 8 ways that you may not know the extent to which Euro 5 diminish our rides. But first, I have to be conscientious and say that we are all for a cleaner environment. This is especially true if you live in the city, where gas-powered cars and motorcycles fill the streets with loud revving engines and release plumes of foul smoke in the air. Wala naman siguro gusto sa inyong huminga ng malapit sa likod ng tambucho ng jeepney, di ba? Well, the Euro 5 emission standards largely address these environmental problems. Imagine walking along a street like Edsa in Manila where you can hear the gusting wind, the leaves rustling and actually smell the trees and the plants along the sidewalk. Parang okay yun, di ba? May problema lang. If you're a motorcycle enthusiast, our rides are more and more affected by these standards in a way that impacts their riding value. As a matter of fact, I personally tend to look at older and lower Euro compliant bikes more favorably. Here's a run through of the top negative effects of Euro emissions restrictions to your motorcycle. Number one, it's the number one cause of hot engines. Fueling is leaner than ever before, resulting in less and less fuel while adding more air to the fuel to air mixture. Without going to the science behind it, which you can easily find online, less fuel means longer combustion, which produces more heat and transfers more of that heat to the surrounding parts of the engine. This results in a hotter engine. Conversely, an unrestricted engine with more fuel will burn quicker and produce less heat. Moreover, catalytic converters convert toxic fumes to more acceptable fumes. One type of cat converts carbon monoxide to carbon dioxide and another converts nitrogen oxides to nitrogen and oxygen. The catch is catalytic converters have to run very hot to function as intended, as high as 870 degrees Celsius or even higher up to 1,000 degrees when the cats are worn and degraded. To emphasize how hot that is, molten lava from a volcanic eruption starts at 1,170 degrees Celsius. That's about 2,140 degrees Fahrenheit. That's why you hear some reviewers say, wow, this, this, this motorcycle is brutally hot. Roasts your leg to describe how hot some motorcycles can be. Of course, even higher revving, higher compression, and V-type engines exacerbate this problem too. Number two, the need for water cooling or exposed radiators. The hotter the engine, the bigger the radiator. I don't know about you, but radiators are unsightly. Plain ugly. They are big rectangles placed in front of an engine and stick out at the sides. Imagine if cars couldn't hide their radiators. They also have loud fans that inevitably blow heat towards your thighs when they turn on. Fortunately, Porsche didn't ruin the design of the 911 when they introduced water cooling to, quote, meet updated safety and emission regulations, unquote. Just think about it. Radiators don't belong on classic and retro design bikes, but OEMs are forced to do it. Number three. This is a biggie. Loss of horsepower and torque. This was actually my first inspiration to research this topic. I rode a Euro 3 and Euro 4 Royal Enfield Himalayan back to back and the difference in torque low down was just night and day. I could easily feel the pull of the engine on the Euro 3 carb type engine while I felt nothing on the Euro 4 fuel injected model. Think rev limiters, electronic fuel in tweaks, to lower emissions. There are quite a few comparisons 
on the same model of motorcycle where the old trumps the new in terms of horsepower. Blockhead, a new tool, compared the previous generation MT-09, 2020 and a 2021 model. On a dyno, the older model was 3 to 5 horsepower more despite having a smaller displacement. The 2020 was 847 cc, but the 2021 is already 890 cc. Reviewers noticed that the second gear of this platform, the CP3 engine, has no little to no torque compared to the first and third gears for the MT-09. Again, a fuel restriction programmed into the ECU. Comparing a vintage 1968 motor motorcycle to its modern counterpart with emission restriction is more telling. Example, the 2017 Triumph T100 Bonneville is a 900cc motorcycle with 55 horsepower. But the vintage 1968 Triumph T100C with only 500cc has 41 horsepower, almost as much as the 2017 Bonneville. Honda admits this. Honda's press release from its own UK website explains what it's doing to comply with Euro 5, from engine tweaks and pipe design to the simplest way to reach compliance, increasing engine size or displacement, which, quote, maintains or improves the same power and torque but reduces the amount of pollutants produced, unquote, because larger engines tend to rev lower, it continues. Quote, Honda has used this to their advantage, increasing the capacity of their Africa Twin from 998cc to 1,084cc, unquote. If you have been riding for a time, now you know that the top-end or flagship BMW GS has increased in engine capacity over the years in part for the same reason. It coincides with the implementation dates for emission standards. Keep in mind that OEMs are given grace periods to fully comply. Now check this chart and look at the dates. In 1999, the GS that Ewan McGregor and Charlie Borman rode from London to New York was an 1150 GS. In 2004, they upped that to 12, a 1200 GS. In 2019, they upgraded it to a 1250 GS. And now in 2023 onwards, there are rumors that the engine will again be bigger to a from 1250 to a 1300 GS. Not all bike models resort to increasing displacement to compensate for loss of power due to fueling and power restrictions. In this example, there is marked reduction in power. The Kawasaki 650 platform on the Versus in 2016 boasts 69 horsepower at 8,500 RPM and 64 newton meters of torque, while the 2022 Euro 5 model with exactly the same displacement now clocks in at 59.6 horsepower at 8,070 RPM with torque of uh, 56.33 newton meters. That's a 14.5% horsepower loss. But wait, there's more. Here is my most favorite example, the venerated Kawasaki H2. The H2 and H2R have the same base engine concept a supercharged 998cc liquid-cooled four-cylinder engine. But get this, the 2022 H2 has 228 horsepower, while the H2R boasts of, get ready, 326 horsepower. Many speculate that there may be difference in componentry in the engines, but at the end of the day, 
one is street legal, a.k.a. Euro compliant, while the other is only for track use. Zero Euro. Number four, makes our motorcycles heavier. What makes an average motorcycle heavier today isn't just the lack of modern cutting-edge alloys or composite materials in their construction, but the need to add more components to the bike for Euro compliance. As mentioned, a bigger engine. An added radiator, also increasing in size. Adding large complex exhaust systems, not only for emissions, but for silencing. This is the reason vintage motorcycles can be much lighter but comparable in HP than their modern counterparts. See the YouTube channel BART or BART who delves into classic motorcycles to see some examples. Number 5 is another way Euro 5 diminish our rides. That is the necessity for larger and uglier exhausts. This is seemingly trivial, but much of the appeal of the motorcycle visually is the look of the exhaust as Honda themselves point out, making them large to accommodate multiple catalytic converters and feature better DB killers makes them look disproportionate. To me, anything with good design starts with proper proportions, whether it's a piece of furniture, a fashion item, or in this case, a vehicle. Here are some examples. A retro Royal Enfield Interceptor 650 in person have really large pipes. And it doesn't just have one, it has two, one on each side. The initial BSA concept, if you've seen it, cheats by making the size of the headers almost the size of the end pipes. Another is uh, Big displacement sports bikes have bigger pipes than a tank's cannon barrel. An yun nang tanki. Nakita nyo ba yung Kawasaki uh, ZX1400? That has a very large pipe. Also, if you notice, OEMs have been hiding these very large exhaust systems underneath the engine, commonly called underbelly exhausts. Again, a compromise. Believe it or not, we're not done yet. Number six, performance quirks. Personally, I may be a victim of this too. If your throttle is snatchy, jerky, or feel on and off, the opposite of smooth, from idle to first roll, you can thank Euro 5 for that too. Zach Quartz of Revzilla explains that due to fueling restrictions at certain rev ranges, throttle response is abrupt from low power to high power to minimize fuel consumption, especially from idle position and down low. I'm sure he explained that better, but again, you can find a more detailed explanation all over the internet as this video is running too long already. Many have fixed this with an easy reflash that addresses abrupt fueling and smoothens fuel delivery, hence power delivery. I for one is looking for a local guy who can do it for me. Number seven, the standards significantly contribute to the higher and higher price of our motorcycles. You probably noticed this. Motorcycles are continually getting more and more expensive. Stricter and stricter Euro emissions are partly to blame. Many OEMs have to redesign engines, exhausts, fueling systems, and ECU mapping, this is software, to meet compliance. It is an uphill battle that seems insurmountable for every new standard passed. The standards are so strict that companies continue to innovate many, many years in anticipation of a new standard down the road. It is such an engineering nightmare that OEMs are forced to consult with external specialists like a company called Ricardo to overhaul their existing bikes and engines to meet compliance. This company is pretty big, by the way. 
Some of the ways they do so is strict fuel moderation through electronic and software-driven systems. Let's start with a ride-by-wire throttle. Another is introducing variable valve timing to limit how long valves stay open to limit emissions. Catalytic converters contribute to high prices too. They use precious metals like palladium and platinum. Hindi lang basa-basa bakal. But even current advances in the field may have reached their effective limit. The process has started producing a more toxic gas, nitrous oxides, different from nitrogen oxide, as a side effect instead of just nitrogen and oxygen. In short, all of these efforts cost a lot of time and a lot of money. Finally, the last one, number eight, bike obsolescence. If OEMs choose not to overall current bikes to comply with stricter and stricter Euro emission standards, many motorcycle models just fade away from existence, at least until OEMs decide to reintroduce them again in the market to comply anew. The Kawasaki KLR 650 discontinued in 2018 but reintroduced in 2021 with, of course, uh, fuel injection, etc., etc. The Suzuki Hayabusa died in 2018 but relaunched in 2022. The Yamaha R6, the venerated R6, was discontinued in 2020 and may not be reintroduced because it was replaced by the R7 which has a different engine altogether. My final thoughts. I've been reading that there is Euro 6 and 7 in the horizon for motorcycles. Problem here is one word. Viability. At some point it will not make sense for companies to invest more money on existing engines and platforms and just throw in the towel, as they have for many of their models. For viewers from advanced economies, the developing world allow cars, trucks, buses, motorcycles with much lower emission standards. Hence, these countries have many brand new models that are not available in Europe, Japan, and other first world economies since countries like the US has a comparable tiered numbered system responsible for penalizing VW and banning their diesel cars. The latest global models on the other hand are all Euro compliant from Honda CBs, BMW GSS, GSS to the Kawasaki Zs. So these models are the exact same motorcycles in Europe, the Americas and Asia. So what's next? Is there a next chapter to the story? As a matter of fact, there is. And they're on their way to you. Some videos like this one take time to research properly and put together, but a few are on their way. Stay tuned, you might just enjoy them. Topics like this doesn't encourage new motorcycle sales. This is the reason why the industry doesn't like talking about it. I plan to make content as honest and with zero bias as I possibly can. Please support me by at least liking the video. From Yare, your average writer on the internet, thank you and always enjoy the ride.